everyone, and welcome to Can I Just Say, a Common Room Radio podcast. I'm Elizabeth Stevens. I'm Daphne Olive, and we have a lovely guest here who's actually my guest at home this weekend. Uh, we have Ellie Collins with us here, who is writer and director of The Blood Crow Stories. Uh, Blood Crow Stories is a serialized horror audio drama. Each season, we do 20 episodes of an original horror story. So they're each contained seasons. You can kind of consume each season as its own individualized story. That's incredible. You do such wonderful work, too. We got to see a live performance that uh, that they did at Dragon Con last year, which is where I met Ellie in person. It was a great time. Yeah, it really was. It was so much fun mm. to see all of the actors together and how they put this really elaborate, like, we just talk about stuff. You all do something <laughs> truly elaborate. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> All right, ladies. So we're going to be talking now about the third and fourth episodes of the limited series of Howard's End. This is the end of our Howard's End road. It's been really fun. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Ellie, we already talked last episode about how we came to Howard's End. So tell us how you came to Howard's End. Uh, you told me to, <laughs> to watch it and highly recommended it. And I adore Haley Atwell and period pieces. So I was all about it. And uh I watched them on the plane here. <laughs> That's wonderful. What did you think? What were your first impressions? First episode was a little hard to get into, I think, just because of the environment of a plane. Oh, of course. Because it's very chaotic and the show is a little slower than a typical action show that can like draw your attention. So, you know, it was a little hard to start with, but by the time I started episode two, I was completely hooked. That's wonderful. Yes, it is very still was a word I kept on thinking as I was watching yeah. it. I have watched it several times now preparing for the podcast. I often fall asleep watching it, but in the most lovely way. <laughs> like I just yeah. feel like the it's music very peaceful. is so peaceful. It is so soothing and lovely that I find myself just feeling very cozy and sort of drifting off. So I completely understand that. I felt that way the, the first one and a half. Mm -hmm. Of the series, but then obviously as situations increase, so did my anxiety. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, it's so funny that we've been we've been noticing that um, all of the sort of previews and trailers and promotional materials are playing it much more like a straight romance, which it absolutely is not. So it's so strange to go in and watch it and feel like the tone of the show is so incredibly different than what was um, what you were given to expect. I think. Well, I feel like it is still a romance story, but not in the way that we think, because to me, at least how I read it was, it felt like a romance story, but a story between Meg and Howard's End. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I like that. Because it follows a lot of the same tropes of like, they're meant to be together, but there's situations that's keeping them from being together oh. and misunderstandings, but then they wind up together in the end because they're meant for it. That's gorgeous. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Oh my God, we're gonna Ellie. Ellie did not listen to our coverage of the book because she hadn't read the book before watching the show. But I'm very amused now because just Ellie, just so you know, like I see, and I'm not the only one. Like a whole subtext of romance between Margaret and and Ruth Wilcox. Yeah, absolutely. Which totally ties in because Ruth Wilcox, in a lot of ways, or Mrs. Wilcox, is Howard's right. End. Yeah, very much so. And I think they say that in the beginning. Yes, they the, should. Yep. The the house is her. Yes, and and I greatly I love stories where the setting becomes its own character. So Howard's End was very much its own character, and you you get movies like Crimson Peak where that house is a character. Mm. So I love when when things do that. Oh, that's excellent. Okay, well I have I've put in our in our list of topics Howard's End at the end, so we can talk about like the meaning of Howard's End and all of that. Yes. Um. I'm just going to be thinking a lot about the romance of Margaret and the and Howard's yeah. end is the way the story is told. It really is. Well, it is. It's so I, I definitely noticed everything about like the fatedness and the destiny. And I guess I had that all tied up so much in, I suppose, like the fairy tale um, aspect of it that I didn't think of it as that romance trope. But that's mm -hmm. gorgeous. Of course, it is gorgeous. That's really lovely. All right, but let's talk about let's start with the romance that is the one that the that the previews are giving <laughs> us. I wanted to start by talking about Margaret and Henry. Mm. What do you all think of that? 
I, it frustrated me constantly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and frustrated me in the sense of like, it was two very headstrong people and Margaret can be kind of a dreamer to a fault in her own way. And then Henry can be logical to a fault mm. in his own way. And while that can be complimentary, it is also absolutely infuriating. <laughs> I had so much trouble watching their conversations only because I feel like Henry just does not know how to listen to Margaret at mm -mm. all. And Meg also doesn't know how to make herself heard to Henry. Because again, I think I, I love how she talks about the language that she and Helen have. I feel like she and right. Henry do not have a language. They don't have like a common tongue. They really don't. But see, what I see... Oh, that's so interesting. What I see is that they're talking at cross purposes, but that but that is the story. That is another version of the story is that they're talking at cross purposes. And then by the end, they are speaking to each other like that they had to go through this process. And I guess my question for you all is like, if you agree with me that by the end they are, you know, once Henry becomes a person who notices things, mm -hmm. who who is overwhelmed even by noticing things by the end. Do you think that they both shifted towards each other or do you feel like Henry ended up doing all of the growing and that Margaret was because we do see like, yes, he like does the whole interrupting thing, like especially when when he comes <clears throat> to their aunt's house and there's like that whole conversation where she's like, no, I want to stay. And he's like, just doesn't really listen. No, yeah, he railroads just doing his own time. agenda. Mm -hmm. But she also confronts him all the time. I mean, think about when he proposes to her. That's true. Like, and she she's already butting knows. in all the time. Like, no, I know. No, you don't have to. No, no, don't tell, no you don't have That's to. That's what made all their conversations so stressful. I think it was like in episode three where they're having two different conversations at one time. I was like, one of you just shut up. Yes. I don't care which one. <laughs> oh, see, for me, I mostly want Henry to shut up. And I feel like that's what she does to him is that she ends up always... She sets him off kilter of this, like, he's got this whole authoritative man thing. Like, I know what I'm talking about. I will just, you know, make the decisions for everyone around me and all that. But that she ends up challenging him in a way that does silence him. Hmm. Like, and and in mul there are multiple situations where, like, when she starts confronting him, he actually reaches a point where he just starts babbling. Yes. Like, when he was talking about the houses. And the money, and too. Just, yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But and when he was talking about the houses, like he didn't consult her. He was like, oh, well, it's, you know, it's damp. And she's just like starts actually asking him real questions. And then he reaches a point where he's like, basically almost gives up. He's just like, well, it just is. Yes. You know, like he's no longer can what use say? reason what on her. What do you Asking questions indefinitely. Just like smokes right. awkwardly. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking exactly. about? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, like to your question, though, like if he did all the growth, I think they both grew in complementary opposing directions. He grew up, mm -hmm. but she settled down. So huh. like they both had this growth arc where they met in the middle by the end. Not even in like a true love live happily ever after way, but I feel like by the end they had a better mutual understanding of each mm -hmm. other. He learned how to notice and how to consider her feelings. And she learned how to see the bigger picture of everything and what was actually important as opposed to just being right and being mm -hmm. headstrong. Right. And being theoretical. I mean, that's yeah. her whole thing that she says to Helen that she's that she's done not what I don't I didn't write down the actual wording, but she was like, I'm finished not recognizing, you know, basically the thing that allows us to have money and be comfortable and all this. I refuse. I oh, it's I, I refuse to take my income and sneer that the at those who guarantee mm -hmm. it. Right. And that's so interesting with what she said in the last I think it was in the second episode where she was talking about being at the edge of the abyss. And she's mm -hmm. like, I don't really want to go in there, but I also don't want to just stand outside yeah. of it anymore. So that that was like a level of progression for her that she went to accepting it in the, in the form of him. Mm -hmm. So do we buy like when she says you take my breath away, do we buy it? Remind me of when she says that. When he very awkwardly proposes oh. to her and he's like so worried that she's saying no to him. And then at some point she says, 
Mr. Wilcox, you quite take my breath away. There we go. Oh my goodness, <laughs> Ellie. <laughs> you, Ellie, just I just want to say, like I'm notes all over the place. Ellie has no notes. <laughs> it's just all she's just straight off the dome. She's piece. just excellent. she's just like yes, <laughs> excellent recall. <laughs> I, I well because I I have a penchant for brilliantly written lines like. I, I think my favorite line in the entire show is her saying that she refuses to fashion a husband using Henry's soul as raw materials. That was gorgeous. I liked that whole, she called it a sermon, and I really liked that that whole sermon. I wonder how much of it was true and how much of it yeah. she was telling herself, because I've definitely done that, been a person who like... I know that I'm making a decision um, that isn't in line with who I am, but let me tell you why it actually is in line with who I am. I definitely felt that happening in that particular conversation. Well, and this is a place actually where book Margaret butts up against show Margaret, and Liz and I are influenced by book Margaret. Book Margaret tries very much actively to change him. And I ah. don't feel like in the show they made that choice. I that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. I see her mostly just being reasonable and standing up to him, but not actively trying to change him into someone else. Yeah. But but actually changing him into someone else in yeah. that process. But I don't see that as like she has an agenda, like I will change this about him and I will change this about him. Yeah. Well, and I, I do believe in a way when she says that he takes or that she um, he takes her breath away. I believe it in a way because um, time is very weird in in this one for me because since I haven't read the book, I don't have a consciousness of how far apart these scenes are. So in the buildup, we see every time she sees him, it's, oh, Mr. Wilcox. Right. Like, you know, she is very enchanted by him every time we've seen her interact with him. So... Not knowing how long that's gone on, it makes sense that by the time he finally proposes, she's like, yes, this person that I, you know, get quite excited to see every time. Mm -hmm. And considering the time frame, if a man makes your heart skip, that's it. Yeah, right. And we I mean, that part I do buy with him. We talked about this in our last episode about how Matthew McFadden like just breathed such beautiful energy into Henry Wilcox. He's so charming. Wasn't he so, so charming? charming? It's like you're being a jerk, but <laughs> you're so delightful. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, there there was very much I had this uh frustration with being so mad at everything yeah. Henry did, but going, yeah, I'd fall for it too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it was a great performance for that reason. Yeah, it really well and he added um a level of joyousness to it mm. that I don't feel like I ever saw in Henry. You know, like when he arrives to Aunt Julie's house and he just he seems like legitimately just overjoyed to Delighted. see all of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's why I got so aggravated at Margaret a lot, because it felt like sometimes she was just disagreeing with him for the sake of disagreeing. Mm. I think because she does do that. Yeah, because with him playing Henry as charming as he did, sometimes it comes off with like, Margaret, why are you doing this? And it it made her oddly unlikable sometimes because it's like, stop being contrary for no reason. Sure. Well, that ties in, Ellie, you noticed while we were watching together, like how Margaret like is so adamant about no one helping her out of a car and no yeah. one doing this. I'm, I think that is part of her personality. And, you know, I want to talk, bring Helen into this soon, into this conversation. But I think that th there is almost a continuum with the three of them where Helen's like the most of that. And Margaret has that too, of just this like, I want to be independent. And she is. But sometimes it's so important to her, that identity, that she will choose the assertion of her independence over being gracious. Yeah. And I think that's why I found it so, um, well, and I, actually, I guess I had mixed feelings. But when she first gets to Oniton for the wedding, and mm -hmm. everyone's telling her, oh, go upstairs and dust off. She's like, no, I'm not dusty. I just want to take a walk. But when, right. when he, uh, when Henry sort of really appeals to her, like, I'm actually counting on you to help me navigate the situation as my wife. And she says, oh, Yes, that is more important, actually, than my taking a walk. And they do, we see later them taking and a walk And then we see together. them walk it, right. So everybody yeah. wins. Everyone gets what they're looking for. And she right. doesn't have to just go storming off into the, uh, into the woods. Well, and that's, mm -hmm. 
that's a really good point because when it's when she feels like it's about propriety, then she's not into it yes. and she butts against it. But when it's about connection, when it's that's about something someone point. needs that's from a her, great point. Mm-hmm. Then she always responds well to that. That is something that Margaret values is being not being useful necessarily. I don't feel like that's the terminology that works for her, but like a of honoring her connection to people. Yeah, I think connection is the word. That's certainly the word that she would use. Yes, right. Well, and I think it's very familial, too, Mm. because she had to raise Tibby and Helen. Exactly. So that feeling of of familial uh, requirements. So she doesn't want to do it if people are just telling her to do it. But her husband needs her to help him. And that kind of kicks in that, like, I need to do what my family needs me to do because that's how she's always been. Hmm. Right. And I think that's when the big conflict also happens is the moment when the conflicting needs are thrown at her. Of course. The moment when she wants to stay at Howard's end, like, okay, he's being an ass. Like there's that. And she calls him out on that. And I love that she called him criminally muddled. But it, but that is a moment where she was forced to decide between what Helen needs from her and what Henry kind of needs from her. No, he's just mostly being an ass, actually. I was going to say maybe a better <laughs> um, reference for that would be when Helen first brings the Basts up right after the wedding. And yes. she has to say, not here, not now. It's Evie's wedding. What are you doing? Um, and she does absolutely choose, well, I was going to say Henry's needs, but it's not even necessarily that because I think she does see that it's not as simple a situation to fix as Helen has decided it is. Helen has no plan. Right. Helen is just, oh, I'll bring you up to Henry and they'll have to make it right without really having any understanding about. Which I thought that moment was a lot of growth for Meg because in mm. saying, you know, if you let me talk to him in my way, I will find a way to help. And if you don't, then I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. She pretty much said, like, you have to let me have a middle ground. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, okay, that's perfect segue to what I, how I do want to bring Helen in. I wanted to talk about how Margaret is essentially a bridge between these two. Like, they are extremes. And I think that moment at the wedding, I mean, that's my favorite, that's my favorite Meg. Like, that's my favorite Meg moment, I think, in the whole show is how she how she balances what is going on with everyone like she i feel like she sees very clearly in that moment she understands that helen is wrong she, she also has a lot of empathy for the bass mm. and she is then balancing you know feeling and propriety yes I like that. Yeah. Yeah, she's very much like a stage manager <laughs> during that <laughs> wedding, like, like making sure that everything <laughs> runs smoothly and everybody at least thinks that they get what they're um what they're asking for, even if she is sometimes shuffling things a bit. But I, I wonder you asked about um or I suppose you, you just mentioned that you felt that Margaret was a bridge between Helen and Henry. Yes. Do you mean yes. do you feel that she brings them together or just that well, I she, think she is a middle I think point between them both um but it, she does bring them together i mean the end of this story is the three of them living very happily at howard's end together but what i see that's interesting to me with the the helen and henry part of it is that i think there are a lot of parallels with henry and helen even though they're they're polar opposites in their worldview but the way they approach the world is very similar. Like they both are very steadfast in their own opinion. They both, unlike Margaret, want to change people. Oh, that's a good point. Right? Mm -hmm. So they're both like very caught up in changing people. They're very caught up in being right. Like what you had said, Ellie, about about Meg a little bit, but, but like Helen, this whole thing with the bringing the bass to the wedding, 
you know, Leonard keeps saying, I don't want to do this. And she's like, no, you will do this because I basically I fucked up. Yeah. So you need to go along with this crazy plan of mine so that I can fix what I messed right. up. Right. And feel better. About and that's myself. what frustrated me. Like the whole Helen and the Bass situation was so frustrating because it was clear that Helen feels that she's very altruistic, but it was very selfish wanting to absolve herself of guilt. Yes. It was she didn't want to help the bash. She wanted to be guilt free. Well, and I think that's always to some extent and we've we've talked in the book and in the first our first episode about this, like about what Helen represents, which is, you know, this idea of helping people, but you know, very much what Henry said about like he compared what she was doing to like the looking at a circus act like that yeah i that was the one time i agreed with him <laughs> right well look, he is very right there i mean he sees helen quite clearly that doesn't make him right in the larger sense necessarily but he's right about her mm. yeah and and so she she it's like they're both having she and henry are having conversation on you know on that at aunt julie's house where they're both basically dehumanizing the Basques, just in a totally just, different way. Right, on opposite ends of that spectrum, sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, and another thing that they have is that, you know, Henry is uncomfortable with emotion, right? And he, and this is where, again, where the, my bridge concept comes from. Like, he's uncomfortable with emotion, and his arc is to accept emotion. Like, at yes. the end, when she takes him back is when he finally is able to express emotion and that is what brings him to this peaceful place mm. at the end helen has too much emotion she's just willing to like have everything be emotion and with no prudence and no you know no thought about practicality or propriety right and dragging a lot of and, people along with her you know um, mm -hmm. of right. course the we bass. said in the book like she she helped she helped leonard to his death basically yeah like, yeah <laughs> She really did. She helped him so much it killed mm. him. Yeah. And so she but her progress when she comes back, when she's pregnant and is at Howard's end, she's basically saying, I, I'm I'm done with that. Like I I went too far. Like so she's this is what I feel like Margaret just keeps doing with these two is like they are the polar opposites kind of pulling at her in two directions. And what they both end up learning is to end up it at her middle ground mm. yeah so it feels like from from the you know i'll do it my way or nothing at all she was saying you have to let me have a middle ground and then the rest of it from that point is them coming to meet her there yeah exactly i like that very much yeah the you remember when we watched it, I like audibly gasped when when she turned around and she was pregnant because I haven't read the book. And that was so much fun for me. I don't remember a time when I didn't know this story. Of so it was just so much fun <laughs> to watch it with someone who doesn't know the story. It was great. And that's part of why if there's something that I know is based on a book, I read the book after I watch it mm -hmm. because um there's a lot of uh, visual storytelling that I want to allow myself to be shocked by yeah. or to be moved by without being prepared for it coming. Hmm. And so I kind of love that I came into this with nothing because certain things hit me harder that I think I I wouldn't have felt that emotion had I gone in knowing about it. Yeah. Well, there are so many lovely subtleties in this particular piece in the visual storytelling. I was noticing, um, Daphne, if you'll remember, at the, at the very last sequence, that last movement of the book, Leonard keeps thinking about the moon. And he has that strange nightmare mm -hmm. about the moon. And we get three separate shots of that gorgeous three-quarter moon. And even though we have none of the beautiful poetic language about it, the moon itself becomes this kind of poetry. And also, I mean, you can't see something like a full moon above, you know, an English manor and a full moon above London and not have some, it's such evocative imagery anyway. So even if you don't know uh, all the prose behind it, it still came out as this wonderful visual representation of, of again, just kind of setting this tone and making things just a little bit more mystical and a little bit more mysterious. It was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. And, and that, you know, the beautiful juxtaposition, which is a big part of the story, less so of the show, but you know that whole the whole ju juxtaposition of like country and city and newness yes. and and 
tradition and oldness and the earth and the tearing down of houses to build new things all the time, the encroaching of of modernity and rejection of the past. Like she does bring that up with Henry, which I liked. So I have a question about couples. Elliot, I talked about not not in this context, we talked about. So there's some really bizarre parallels between the Basts and Margaret and Henry. Really? One of them is the woman calling the man my, my boy. boy. Which I don't remember that in the book. I don't know if that's in the book. Like that it's might be so a choice. It's so weird to me from a dialect standpoint. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it was just, it, it was very awkward. And it would kind of like take me out of the moment a little bit because it felt so disjointed with their relationships. Yes. Yeah, I would agree. That okay, so that's interesting too. See, I to me it feels like a very deliberate choice. Aside from dialect questions, like t- there are few things that end up being parallels in the way the couples talk about themselves. Like we have the question of loneliness, right? So that's like the big conversation before the proposal right. that Henry and Margaret have, where Henry's like, "Oh, so you're lonely too." And then we that have was the conversation. A conversation. <laughs> right. No, but no, that, but it's like I feel I, like that was the part where they were missing each other the very most. I had a lot of trouble watching that particular scene. I mean, it was adorable. It was very fun to watch. It was oh, in the car executed. with the whole car thing. Oh, yes. the car thing. It was gorgeous. The, it was from start to finish. Very, it was yeah, just swing and a miss, both of them over and over again. See, <laughs> I, I kind of love it because if you know that how Hen- how nervous Henry is about the fact that he's about to do this proposal. Okay. And when he sees, when she says that, when he realizes that she was also lonely, like it's, this is a, this is a second or third watch kind of experience of it, is that when knowing what he's about to do and how awkwardly he's about to do it, when she, when he realizes that she said she was also lonely, his face was so evocative of like, uh, like, I'm so nervous, but oh my God, I maybe have a shot at this. Nervous, but relieved. Yeah. Right. I, I just wish I could hear her trying to, again, to connect with him, talking about moving and leaving this house right. that she lived in for so long. And he was just not listening, just not listening. No. All he heard was, no. oh, you just repeated the word I, I said, lonely. Yes, you're lonely too. Like, well, yes, I'm lonely, but I'm also trying to tell you something important about my life and my experience. Oh, see, yeah, we're just going to have to disagree on how that scene plays. <laughs> I see him as nervous and, and desperate to do something. He he's definitely just doing is, it poorly. But he's doing it poorly. Yeah. No, I think he that we do doing actually it agree. I think it just maybe be bothered Well, and also, you, I think it's important to see from his perspective and from the way we talked about this in the last episode when when she took him to her lunch place, like they had the two lunches yes. and in her lunch place. And we were like, we were like, we totally got how she was like, look at this dude. Like, he's totally game for my crazy lunch place. I think that all of this is so foreign to him, like just everything about the way she talks. Sure. Like the fact that she started addressing his driver, the fact that she, you know, she's like, she's also trying too hard in a weird way. She's like... Let's talk about types of engines. Let's Look talk about this. Let's I do it. It's like yes. she's very busy showing how knowledgeable she is. And so she's trying to connect in a way that is also a miss as far as I'm concerned. Mm. That's completely and, fair. And so I just I I see it less. I mean, there are moments where Henry's like just being super obnoxious, but I think it's important to realize how foreign she is to him also. And I liked that because normally in these kind of stories, he would have immediately rejected her for those things. And then she would have found a nice boy who's a little weird like her, too. Mm, And the fact that he was fascinated by it instead of repulsed was was a point in his column for me to be like, all right, we're going this route. I'm good with it. Well, but it felt like she was doing it so much on purpose. I was just going to ask like, that it, if you ladies she felt was that desperately particu- chasing him. away. Yes. Like particularly with Crane. I wondered if she wasn't yeah. trying to be like, really, you should talk to them and use their name because they are people right. too, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Remember, she is like Helen. Like she is, she is like a little sanctimonious. Mm. You know, she's got that side of her. Absolutely. And like, and there were just times where it felt like, like she wanted to have egg on his face a yes. little bit. Like, I'm going to take you to this lunch place because I know you're going to hate it and you're going to act like a total jerk about it. Like... 
I completely agree. She wound up, you know, being surprised by him. And I think that's what does play into you take my breath away. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Is that she did. She wound up charmed by that because he didn't fall play to it. Okay, let me posit this way of looking at the two of them. He's kind of an ass, right? And he, he improves with time. Like by the end of the story, he has become a person who notices things right. and is overwhelmed and learns to incorporate emotion into his being. I feel like he always goes at his conversations with her with absolute sincerity. Like he's kind of an ass and he comes like, like he said, I'm not of your set. Like he's he. He comes from a world that we, we, the three of us, might be more inclined to find a bit offensive by nature, but I don't think he ever is trying to confront her. He's always trying to be good to her. We just don't like what, what he stands for. His vision of that is, mm. right, because it's very patronizing and stuff like that. She, on the other hand, often, like Ellie just said, goes into it confrontational. Well, and she gets, uh, again, like Helen, she gets other people hurt in, in the process. I wasn't perhaps hurt, but she put Crane in an impossible position. Exactly. <laughs> like, she really what did. What did he do? Because <laughs> he wanted to be polite and answer her. Right. And Henry's like, Crane, shut the fuck exactly. up. And, but like, <laughs> Crane, <laughs> Crane, what's Crane going to do? I'm He's like trying. Re- well, it's, it's the same thing with the, it's with the guy who comes at breakfast when she asks about her sister. And he's like, do you want me to send someone? Do you, do you want me to, like, yes. how can I serve you? To but, handsome but, butler. But, yes. Right. <laughs> he was very right? handsome. He was very handsome. <laughs> he could be doing other work, I feel Too like. handsome to play the help on a show exactly. like this. <laughs> well, and she just is breaking the molds of the expectations of everyone. And again, these expectations are based in inequalities that we should be against. Mm. But... That doesn't mean that she's not just like basically just like walking around with a baseball bat saying smash, smash, smash. You know, yes. I will. I'm going to just smash all of these formats that you all right or wrong. You all, all kind of know where you stand in this. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to make everyone uncomfortable because I really want to assert my own idea of what my independence should look like. Yeah. Mm. I think that's very. I fair. have a question for y'all since i haven't read the book how much time passed between uh mrs wilcox's death and his proposal we don't know the book is also unclear about that Uh, because to me that that changes his character a lot because in the show it feels very fast which makes it almost sinister but i feel like in the book it's not as fast so it might not come because when he first started to propose i was like this is dark like in initially watching it it felt sinister as opposed to adorable like it felt like this this is a stretch but just in in watching only those two episodes on the plane and getting really absorbed in it it felt like he was offering it as a way to guilt-free keep the house oh interesting I think that when I first read the book, I had that feeling as well. And you actually it does have more fast, interactions. Ellie. Even in the book, it happens Right. It definitely quick. happens fast. Well, because we know that, I mean, this is in the show as well. We know that she talks to Mrs. Wilcox about losing the house. And I think that's actually probably the only way. I do think she actually, when she's talking to Mrs. Wilcox, she maybe says the time frame of when they're going to lose the house. She does in the show. So what was the time frame that she said? She said that they had to be out by May. I was going to say, I feel like it was months. I, yeah, I, it, it was, was months. months. Oh, so it this was, is crazy fast. Yeah, it was quite quite quick. Mm. But we have the Charles, like Ellie brought this up but while we were watching, the Charles's children. Oh. Yeah. Charles's right. children in the show was what confused me because I was like, okay, what is, because they, with it being a short series, it felt very fast. But by the time we see Charles and Dolly again, they are on to baby number three, which means it's at minimum been two years. That is interesting. Right? I do think that the engagement is long. Oh, right. Because they have to wait for Evie to get married. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, I was like, if he... If he's just, like, proposing to keep the house in a guilt-free way, you know, that makes what he does more sinister, right. but then also gives a different light of character growth that he starts from a super selfish motive of, well, if I marry her, then if she ever finds out she was supposed to have the house, I still have the house. 
I don't. You know, and then he just grows to actually genuinely care for her and grow as an individual. Yeah. I don't think that's the story. Like, I, like maybe. But also book, I watched the show once and really right. fast. Right, right, right. No, but and, and I feel like if anything, the show makes it seem less that because he does seem honestly moved by her. I do want to talk about like romanticism. I guess that's like this is another parallel specifically in conversations with Helen, where Helen is basically, you know, we've talked about the Margaret side of the conversation where she talks about not wanting to change Henry. But Helen's side is basically like, how could you be in love with this person because of whatever Helen's idea of love is? And then she essentially has the same conversation with Leonard. And I found letter, Leonard's words very interesting. Like, we can also talk about the economic aspect of their conversation, which relates to stuff earlier in the story. But but she says to him, like, what could you two, Leonard and Jackie, what could you two possibly have in common? And he says, we have companionship in common. I find that really interesting because I feel like that's something that Helen doesn't get, like the kind of casual um, day-to-day intimacy that is part of couplehood. Like, I love the whole thing with with Margaret and Henry and how they touch hands all the time. Like, you see them oh, yeah. look at each other in this way that's just like, even, you know, even at Evie's wedding, like, they're already looking at each yes. other the way married people look at each other, like that just, you know, that just like checking in, yes, mo- like momentary intimacy is just really touching to me. And then right before they have the whole house conversation that's super annoying, they have that moment where she was at the window and he's sitting and then she just strolls by him and they just touch hands for a second. And it was just, for me, that was such a beautiful expression of that kind of domestic intimacy Mm -hmm. that is companionship. Like that's, it's, I just feel like there's an interesting conversation happening there where someone like Helen, who basically only lives in the theoretical and maybe Mm -hmm. we could argue really only is thinking about her own feelings when she talks about feelings she's really only talking about her Her own feelings feelings. yes Mm -hmm. um that that the basts and the margaret henry wilcox couple um have this other thing that helen can't really see and see, I I think that was a growth thing for Helen to learn to see it, because in the beginning, she just wants to run off with Paul. Right. And she's completely, she's enchanted by him the same way that Meg winds up enchanted by Henry. Mm. And she just rushes straight into it, doesn't really think about it, doesn't understand that whole aspect. And then, you know, she's completely torn apart by being told that she can't be with him. And I think through the bass and... uh Megan Henry through two completely different kind of marriages that show that very mature, you know, non-vocal intimacy with each other. She learns through the two of them what actually matters relationship wise. Oh, and that's true because then she talks about when she says she doesn't want to see Leonard again, she's like, yeah. he'll just worship me. Yes. Yeah. She we're learns worship. what it actually means. Right. Right. And where worship is actually, I think, more in line with the idea she had of romanticism, like a yeah. mutual worship is, I think, what she would have thought of as the ideal. But that's very different than companionship. Well, and I feel like her and Leonard is the inverse of her and Paul. And it takes that for her to learn who she was. Yes. And to mature from that. Right. Mm. Yeah. We had talked in the book like about how she had kind of a she had objectified Leonard through wanting to help him. But then she had the experience of Leonard objectifying her through his worship. Absolutely. Hmm. And I think in that instance, that takes us back to Margaret's lovely little sermon that she gives about how uh, Henry will always have these portions of himself that she knows nothing about. And she will always have things that happen in her life and in her heart that he knows nothing about. And that I I think had never occurred to Helen when it came to a romantic relationship, just because she is a capital R romantic in so many ways. And we learn uh, with the interiority we get from her even when she goes to a concert and the way that she hears and sees music as stories in her head. I think that this idea of having companionship that 
isn't where this other person is absolutely everything to you. Right. For her is then a, a failing. Well, then you're doing it wrong. Then you're not really in love. And I love that Margaret can show her. I don't like this, those subtleties of companionship, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And that Leonard exactly. could too. Right. Well, and what's beautiful with her, like, just like Henry kind of goes through this huge arc that takes him to this place at the end where he's really at peace mm. and like has the joy without the pompousness. The beautiful thing about Helen is that she also has kind of tempered herself. And I love that it's her that calls to them and like brings them out to see the tall grass yeah. because she still has she still has the romanticism. Like that's her contribution right. to their threesome. Absolutely. She didn't lose it. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. it's like because yeah. this is, I guess, like my whole going back to my bridge concept is like it's almost like I feel like Margaret really is Mrs. Wilcox. We're about to get into like uh-huh. that she is a Mrs. Wilcox. Like she is of the earth that she's someone who has a constancy to her i hear that doesn't require in the story that she changed so much and she has these two elements on either side of her that are extremes and she without forcing them to it but by confronting them she confronts both of them constantly and calls them on their bullshit and that helps them each come to a place of more balance. So yeah. she says that she says she says about Helen that she's not. What, what I did write this one down. Where is it? Um, she said something like she's not unbalanced. She's without balance or something like that. Yeah. And and then at the end, all three of them are contributing different asp like a more or the two of them she kind of hasn't changed that much i think i don't think margaret changes i don't think she changes very much right i would agree um but the two of them because they are less extreme she's less required to confront them than she used to be sure and that they are each now contributing the things that they have that are good feeling on one side and practicality on the other or or propriety. I mean, propriety in a good sense, yes. like not, not, you know, um, that once the two extreme people are tempered, they, the three of them can live as an ecosystem where everyone's contributing something to the kind of beauty of, of a life of companionship. Mm-hmm. Well, and I feel like there was a good lesson to be learned in how Helen and Henry changed from the fact of Helen is a as you said, a romantic with a capital R and Henry is logical with a capital Mm -hmm. L. And both of them essentially learned that romanticism and logic are a way to view things. They're not a way to live. Oh, I love that. And I feel like that's a very important lesson because through Helen, you kind of see like, yes, it's wonderful to be swept up into romantic fantasy situations, but you can't live your life that way. Not without a lot of collateral damage. Yeah. And that's kind of what Margaret has to pull them to. And I mean, there was collateral damage in Henry's logic, too. I mean, essentially, Mr. Bass wound up the collateral damage of everybody. Absolutely. (laughs) Yep. Yes, he did. And, And it was kind of nice, like, narratively to see how... Three different approaches to the world wound up affecting this one man yes. tragically on all three sides. Mm-hmm. I wonder, Ellie, can you talk to us about how Leonard Bast worked for you? Mm. Yes, please. So um, from viewing it, not not reading it, um, I was meh on him for a very long time yeah. just because... Everything he said was cryptic or he wasn't talking at all. There there was no like view into why or how he's doing anything. So he was like a character that as a viewer, you want to, you know, you always want to view the world with the character, but he keeps slamming the door in your face at every instance. And I was like, we mm-hmm. only have four episodes. <laughs> give, give yourself to the viewer. <laughs> and, but... By episode three, I could see that his worship of Helen was developing, and Jackie, which I'm sure we we will discuss Jackie at some point, Jackie was very unlikable for me in how the narrative treated her, so 
I was a bit pleased when he had his dalliance with Helen because it felt like his character finally did something. Sure. Made it because he was a passenger to everyone else's story mm. and now he did something he wanted to do for the first time. And it was terrible, but it felt like his character finally joined the rest of the story. Sure. Wow, they really messed up with Leonard. They did. Huh? I really, they I really, really did. feel like he's they... in the book. He's actually a POV character, and he's extremely sympathetic. See, and yes. I feel like I lost you did with him not being POV, and them taking away the kind of POV that they gave to everyone else. I could not connect with him at all. Like his his death was sad, but like sad in what it meant for other people. Sure. Mm. Yeah, we went into this the last time because Liz was explaining to a friend she was watching with about, like, you spend, he's not like, you don't spend a huge amount of time in his mind, but the time you spend in his mind is so important. Right. Because you really, you really get the sense of a person who aspires to beauty, but is so limited by economic hardship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it felt like the entirety of his story is... Wife gripes at him needlessly all the time, and he just never speaks. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I was like, I feel like there 100% has to be more to this character, yeah, but with yes. what I am solely given right now, I feel nothing for him. That's too bad. That is too bad. Yeah, my, my friend who I mean, I'm going book, to read the book. Yeah. Now. I'm going to read it. <laughs> my friend who didn't read the book also found him very unsympathetic. And in fact, found him like creepy and skeevy most of the time and just did not like him at all. So... A little b his first uh his first foray into the house just annoyed me from a viewer aspect when he just up and leaves. Yeah. Right. I'm like, I have absolutely zero clue why you just randomly left. It it felt like when it felt like when you're watching high school theater yeah. and an actor walked out with the rest of the cast and then realized they weren't supposed to be in that scene. <laughs> oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> oh, so what about when Leonard shows up at Howard's end at the end? Did that seem motivated to you or just how the heck did he get here and why? It was very confusing because he just sits up in the middle of the night. Right. <laughs> and leaves. Well, he did see Margaret. He saw Margaret and Tibby the day before. Yeah, but it's but it's the way though? that he just yeah, yeah. up and sat up and apparently put on a three piece suit in total silence <laughs> because Jackie didn't wake up until he's putting on his socks. <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then he just goes. Like it it felt like in in like a fantasy series that would be when someone had a vision. Right. You know, and they're Which like, I must some, go like, to in the her. book he does have like a dream, the dream about the moons and the snakes. It's all very kind right. of strange and weird and mystical anyway. And very abrupt. It's very abrupt in the book as well. So I really can't necessarily say that that's a fault of the adaptation. But I, I do feel pretty strongly that that is where this adaptation falters is yeah. with Leonard Bast because well, I think they it do felt so it much. felt the reverse of the high school student on stage. It felt like he went, "Oh crap, I'm supposed to be in the next scene," <laughs> and got dressed and ran. Exactly. So. Yeah. Wow, Leonard Bast. He's just not very good at direction. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Bast, high school theater. <laughs> huh. Oh my goodness! That is too oh bad. wait, Liz, I have a question for you. Yes. Um. When they're in the train and Helen says Henry Wilcox, do you think that Jackie rec like knew who she was talking about? I think yes and no. I think she thinks to herself, oh, I knew a Henry Wilcox once. But I think she is genuinely surprised when she sees him and says, oh, Hen, or whatever it is. Right. Because I'm pretty sure in the book... There is no mention of him. Like, it's a complete so. surprise. And she, that was an interesting choice. Yeah. Well, the, and the look the actress gave was kind of like a, oh, me? Oh, no, no, I, no, I don't know. Exactly. So she did seem guilty. Like, like she, rec I think she at least recognized the name, but I think she was right. still surprised when, oh my God, no, it is my Henry. Right. Because Ellie, because Ellie asked me like, oh, did she just recognize like not knowing yeah. that Jackie and Henry I have a history. She did the name. Ellie, Ellie's like, wait a minute. She knows who Henry is. And yeah. she didn't even know what was coming. This and I bad. was like, yeah. and I had noticed it and thought, oh, that's so odd that they have Helen say his name and and how weird. But it was Ellie's reaction to it where I was like, oh, this is a weird choice. 
It's not a necessary choice. Well, and see, for me, it it felt well, sinister. Exactly. Because, well, firstly, it's because it puts an interesting light on how aggressive she was with thinking that Leonard was cheating on her. Oh. Because she's being super aggressive about it that whole time with, you know, who's this card? And I'm just going to show up at this woman's house. And attributing to the unlikableness where I was like, woman, stay home, ask a question. <laughs> and <laughs> like, Jesus. And uh, but then when they're on the train and she recognizes Henry, it seemingly she seemingly is like, oh, we're going there. And then it makes her uh, talking to Henry more sinister because she doesn't even try to play like she doesn't know him. Sure. Right. I see. It. It's immediately to the nicknames, to the familiarity that it felt like she recognized his name and spent that whole time waiting for that moment. Mm. And it that made, made it feel dark. Right. That's what I'm saying. It makes it makes Jackie seem more mercenary. Yeah. So what did you th- how did you feel about Jackie then, Ellie? I didn't like her. Just at all. Be- beginning to end, never. Like, yeah. like at all, because like one of the first conversations we see with him, she's just going, are you going to marry me? 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 And he's like, yes, for fuck's sake. <laughs> like, I said yes. And, and that whole conversation was really weird because I was like, why is she doing nothing in this scene but badgering the same question over and over why is this the only thing that they're talking about and it felt like every scene she was in she was being needlessly aggressive towards him and not but not needlessly aggressive in the way that helen was because helen was doing it in a challenging way whereas hers just felt constantly questioning and constantly putting him on the defensive and they were questions that didn't feel like they narratively made sense in the moment Oh, because they didn't build the scene out so it's just and now we're gonna cut to jackie with more intruding questions jackie (laughs) (laughs) and and it was like why are we cutting to the weather girl telling us about the weather Mm. you know like Give Jackie a reason to ask these questions. Show us a situation that would cause her to be like this. You know, if if she's suspicious of Leonard because she was once a mistress, give us a reason to think about that. Sure. You know, so none like she did a lot of the same things that Helen did, but with zero motivation in the show. So it made her very unlikable for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's a very unsympathetic character, unfortunately. She's tricky in the book, too. We had yeah. a very difficult time navigating around talking about Jackie. Right. But I think in the book, it serves a purpose that they're not managing to serve in the show, partly because you are sympathetic to Leonard and Jackie's the check on that. So, like, in the book, the everyone is flawed. Mm-hmm. And everyone deserves criticism. And Leonard, I think, without, I mean, this is, you know, that's a horrible way to treat a character to be like, you exist so that we will have, that we will expose a flaw about a different character. But that is kind of Jackie's role in the book. Right. Like, she's not, you're never in her POV. She's completely objectified by everyone. Um, but in the book it serves a purpose for you for your emotional state as the reader because everyone's objectifying her in the same way even people like so Helen and Leonard essentially are objectifying her in the same way and so that you kind of it would be very easy otherwise to just be like Helen's wrong and Leonard and Leonard is her victim and so Jackie serves to show kind of how systematic this is, that, that everyone manages to look down on, on someone, someone else and objectify yeah. them. I mean, except it makes Jackie. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and with that intent of like altruism too. Like, right. no, no, I'll exactly. take care right. of you because so clearly Leonard's you can't being take care of yourself. Towards Jackie. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I felt like I got 
a uh, false idea of what they were going to do with Jackie and Leonard from the beginning, because the way that they were setting up the situation, like if my brother found out and all this, I was like, oh, wow, they're really going to tackle like an interracial couple in this time. What an interesting dynamic and thing that they're going to. Nope. Yep. That was a mess we too. never actually even find out what his brother's deal is. You know, not narratively, like you explained it to me, mm-hmm, but right. <laughs> as far as just viewing from the show, we never actually find out from the show what any of their problem is, right. Right. because it's not tied with what it felt like they set up. Right. Right. And you never really get, also in the book, you never really get the story of like, how how did they end up together? Like, why is Leonard, you know, he's very, very young. He's much younger than her. Like, how did he end up in this this uh, dubiously chivalrous role that he chose for himself in relation to Jackie. See, I thought it was, and this will sound weird to say, but I thought it was out of pity. I think it is. Because the way that he talks about it and the way that he talks about, you know, their poverty and everything, I feel like at some point their paths crossed Mm -hmm. and she was probably a sweet, lovely person who was very poor. Mm -hmm. And he thought, well, I'm going to be a man and I'm going to provide right. for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's probably exactly how, right. That's probably exactly how it plays out. All right. Can we move on to Howard talking about Howard's end? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie, this is, I'm laughing because I really love to talk about Ruth Wilcox. And for me, talking about Howard's end is talking about uh, Ruth Wilcox. Mm-hmm. Um, do you mind if I tell you a little bit of stuff from the book? Go right ahead. I'm very emotional about the house. So, <laughs> so in the book, uh, just like in the show, it's Ruth's. But in the book, even more so than I feel in the show, um, they really you your experience of Ruth Wilcox is that she is of the house, not just hmm. the owner of the house, but that she's of the house and of the earth. And there's a lot of ties to tradition traditions in england with the house that it was tied to to, to the, i forget to the teeth and the tree did that show up in the show or is that just in the book uh i think she touches like a horse she tells us to, right in so the the, show? this whole thing about like know. about like the traditions of england are tied up in this and and every image you have of ruth wilcox is like of her you know covered in straw and like part of the earth and like in juxtaposition to her to her family who are all very like sporty and proper and like what you would expect aristocratic people to be like but she's almost she's almost goddess like and and that plays into how i was feeling about this will be a weird parallel Mm -hmm. but the the whole concept of um of Meg and them's house getting torn down to build fancy flats, it felt like that's what happened within the ownership of Howard's End. Oh, the old yes. traditions mm-hmm. died off and the modernization came into the home. And so saying that she was very tied with tradition, everything very much feels like mm-hmm. that. It feels like, you know, the transformation that England was going through at the time was kind of... uh distilled down into that experience as the experience of one family. Yeah, that's oh, I'm lovely. so glad that that got expressed. That that makes me really happy because mm-hmm. I was very concerned that that wasn't coming through in the show. No, but you're right too. Like this idea that, you know, that it goes from being an ancestral house to being a house you would just let to somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that's already a very different relationship to a home. Yes. Yeah. And And I feel like it was, you know, the – the Mrs. Wilcoxes of the house represent the two eras of England. Oh, interesting. Oh, see that. Oh, that's very interesting. Cause I, I've always seen it and this might be the book influencing me is there's a continuum of Mrs. Wil- like that. There's always a Mrs. Wilcox. Yeah. But it's the two eras. Right. But for me, it's like the fact that Mrs. Avery like confuses Margaret with Ruth is the idea. It's almost like a, you know, almost like a God that's dies and is reborn is that is that the, that that's actually a constant that's actually in opposition to to this cycle of modernity that's happening. Well, and I I agree with that to the point of, you know, the house always has a Mrs. Wilcox, much right. like England is always England. But, 
you know, the house has to get a new Mrs. Wilcox, a new era Mm -hmm. to have a different life Mm. in the house. So I agree Mm. that there's this constant of always being a Mrs. Wilcox, but much in the way that society changes, there's just a new like an up- Mrs. A- Wilcox. An updated, an updated <laughs> Mrs. Wilcox. Mrs. There's, Wilcox a modern, there's a modern Mrs. Wilcox in there now. And, you know, maybe one day there will be another Mrs. Wilcox mm-hmm. in there. Um, or, honestly, Mr. Schlegel. Right. That's true. They're breaking that. Oh, I never thought about that. The Schlegels are breaking the, oh, right. the cycle. They are, which is totally appropriate. Wow. Which breaks the cycle completely of right. English tradition into full modernality. Right. And and it becomes interesting because it becomes almost like, I don't know when the book was written. Early but, 1900s. Yeah. So it becomes almost a prediction of what England is going through now with what we see how the royals are breaking right. all royal tradition mm. and England is stepping out of who it used to be. So it's. Again, Margaret becomes the bridge right. between house traditions and the future of the house. Mm, that's lovely. Oh, I like that too. That real and the, yeah, you're gonna love all of that in the book. That totally works. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, I love that. I also, um, I've always loved it as a woman's space, which you know is related to this. But I love that when they arrive, when Henry's showing, like when she, when Margaret first comes to the house, and he's like, "Oh, it's locked. I have to go get the key." Yeah. But it's not it's locked, not locked. Margaret. Yeah. Well, I love her walking through the rain and touching the greenery. It's all oh, God, very it's so ethereal beautiful. and beautiful going through that hedge. Yes. Again, that kind of fairy thing that we were talking about before and that her being destined for the house is it. I think that that plays beautifully. Yeah. Wait, the scene like... was so emotional for me because mm-hmm. it was so right that the first time she experienced the house was alone. Yes, mm-hmm. of course. You know, and and it goes to the lovers thing. You know, the first time the oh, lovers right. truly see each other for mm-hmm. the first time. Ah, uh, yes, that's lovely. See, now I want to go and reread the book with the whole lovers concept. I like yeah, that so much. It's very good. <laughs> right. See, because I very much tied into like the goddess thing, and then Mrs. Mrs. Avery is almost like some sort of accolade mm-hmm. to the to the goddess mm-hmm. that is the Mrs. Like a Mrs. Wilcox, and that's why she's. Um, She's saying she like she speaks in a way that is not completely sensical. Like she's like, oh, you know, you live here now. You asked me about her saying 50 years of mistakes. Like, oh, yeah. she, she speaks, speaks very much in ways that almost feel like like she's living on a slightly different plane yes. than everyone else. Like <laughs> she's having her own experience of what Howard's End and Mrs. Wilcox's are. Mm-hmm. Um, one tidbit in the book that's amazing is that when she's setting up the house, like, so there's that whole thing of like that Margaret, when she is writing Helen, she's saying that she, she was glad she did or something about that their house didn't have the life in it anymore. Oh yes. Glad you didn't see it. The life had been taken out Mm -hmm. of it. And then that's what Mrs. Avery is doing is imbuing Howard's end with their life. Mm. And I did love that because I, (laughs) because I, I tend to love um, focusing on the help of period pieces. Like, that's part of why I liked Downton Abbey. Yeah. Um, So I loved just the idea that Mrs. Avery looked at all those boxes and went, nah, and just opened them and started doing it herself. She was like, nope, this is your home. We're just going to make it that way. Everyone can kiss my ass. (laughs) Well, and you live here. I mean, that's what she said. You live here. Yeah. Like, and I love that the... The accepting of the new Mrs. Wilcox into the house was her call. Mm. Right. Exactly. She made that decision. Because she's of the land. She's of that property. Yeah. Also, so yeah, the tidbit in the book is that Mrs. Avery actually set up a nursery as well. Uh, (laughs) I love her. (laughs) Yeah, you're going to love Mrs. Avery. She gets a lot more. She's fabulous in the book. You get a lot more Mrs. Avery and she's amazing. It, I think my love for the help, too, is why, like, everything with Annie kept stressing me out so Poor bad. I was like, Annie. she's trying so hard. Someone stop yelling at her. Like, I know. Oh, I know. Dear. Annie cannot cut a break there. I know. Like, when she was gone for so long with the hat, like, I noticed it before Helen did. And I was like, oh, my God, Annie, please come back. Someone's going to yell yes. at you. Like, and yet the Schlegels don't. I mean, that's the thing. The Schlegel, well, Helen gets a little annoyed with her for a second. But right. otherwise, like, everyone's pretty... Everyone's really respectful of her. Right. But like she was so stressful. <laughs> uh but then it 
It was also kind of interesting to see, you know, like the maid of the Schlegel house, anxiety times a thousand because they're they're new. Right. Oh, she. but the maid from the old house, she's truly the one running the house. Right. right. Oh, that makes sense. Sure. Parallels all over the place. No, I think it would make necessarily uh, Annie more nervous to not quite know what's expected what's of expected. her because right. of yeah. the way that. Because there's no tradition. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. There's no precedent set for what she should do Hmm. or how she should behave. But Miss Avery's like, I have been doing this an entire lifetime. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like all of that very much. Let's talk about Tibby for a second. I mean, other than he's adorable and we love him. I love him so much. (laughs) He really is perfectly cast. I love Tibby because it's so... It's so unusual to have someone play the bratty little brother, and it's just so charming. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, my God. I loved it. (laughs) He was so wonderful, even when he was being completely annoying. I thought it was very sweet that he goes so far out of his way trying to help out Helen. And then when Charles comes in, it's like, how can you not even care about your sister? Uh, Excuse me. I I like that very much when he says, I won't be bullied even by you, even in your father's house. So I I do like Tippy quite a lot. So I have a question about a specific question that just occurred to me recently about Tibby. When he was in the house by himself, teaching himself Chinese, mm-hmm. it suddenly occurred to me that there's all of this talk of loneliness and companionship and connection. And Tibby is the person, like he even says when he's talking to Helen, then like, I just don't understand people. Yeah, I understand no one, he says. Yeah. So what an interesting thing to have a character in this book that's all about people desperately trying to make connections, even when it's really difficult, mm. to have a character who really, in a large sense, lives in very self-satisfied yeah. isolation. Just does not need that. Right? Yeah. I think I I took Tibby completely differently in that way. Okay. Like, I took it as, you know, everyone is fighting for all these connections, and Tibby just has no idea how. Right. The only phrase that we hear him actually speak in Mandarin, though we see him studying it for quite some time, the only phrase he says is, come on in, Mm -hmm. which is a very inviting, warm, building a connection kind of phrase that it felt to me that it was like, you know, he's learning how to let someone in, but in a completely different language, which felt like the kind of sum up of him hmm. that, you know, he would like to be close to people, but he doesn't even speak the same language as the other characters. But he doesn't seem unhappy. No, I just so think unhappy. it's something that he recognizes he doesn't know how to do. Right. right. But that's what's interesting to me is that, like, we have all this turmoil and the person who could be lonely, like, is quite isolated doesn't seem at all unhappy it's like what are what are we saying about the striving to make connections Mm. i think he's got i think by the end of it he builds the connection with his sisters but he still doesn't speak the same language so i think for him it was learning how to connect in his own way which isn't the same as everybody Mm -hmm. else around him but I just, I don't know, there's something about it that, that I found fascinating, that he just, he seem, he's the only character that really seems at peace. Yeah, yeah. definitely so. Well, and, and everyone takes care of him so much, too. I wonder if that's not part of it. So he's never trying to take care of anybody else. I was so happy for him when he stood up to Charles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he has no responsibilities to anybody else, so nope. he can kind of escape those trappings. Yeah. Yep. I mean, although he does take responsibility for trying to help Helen. He does. But yeah, he does. He felt like the voice of the audience at times, like when uh when Jackie showed up at the house and he just blurts out like, Oh yeah, he was here. They thought he'd take the silver. <laughs> like, thank you for cutting through the bullshit of this situation. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Tippy. Yes, we enjoyed him very much. I don't know if I really like have any strong fe- t- Tibby feelings from the book, but yeah, this Tibby is I delightful. Him. I adored yeah. him so much. So, okay, so we talked a lot about costumes in our last episode. It turns out that we have a guest costume expert here. Uh-huh. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, my only real observation about costumes in this one is the lack of red, is that, well, is and that did you Margaret see, is not wearing red. They had Charles in a red tie. They had... Yeah. 
Dolly in red? Why did they give Dolly red? They had uh, everybody was in, had red really? at least at some point. Yes, I definitely so they're really wrote it down. They're just they're just messing with our whole red theory from I, the first totally two episodes. Are. It's very frustrating. Yeah, let's see. Um, <laughs> we really liked our red theory. We sure did. But see, you, when you said the red theory, because um, usually I'll watch something three or four times before I grab all of the costuming references. Um, but I agreed with the red. Because when when the big row happens and Helen is head to toe in red, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right, and she is at her most confrontational, and uh, Meg is only wearing a red scarf, but it's a very similar red scarf to Helen's, and in that moment she is sort of on Helen's side, mm-hmm. so it felt like the the red was symbolic. The amount of red in the costume was symbolic of how bold they were willing to be in that moment. Mm, I like that. Mm-hmm. And and I appreciate how Helen or not. Yeah, Helen, um, her clothes throughout the whole thing are they read very juvenile because she doesn't have the long sleeve. She mm-hmm. has the three quarter sleeves. She wears more bold prints. Mm-hmm. But by the end, when she shows up pregnant, she's in muted tones, more conservative clothing. You know, she looks drastically more mature just from a change of clothing from juvenile fashion to parental fashion. Mm -hmm. And I greatly appreciate that. Yeah, that's (laughs) That's lovely. lovely. I have no costume comments for this one. <laughs> no, that was mostly mine, is that I was so surprised to find even Henry. They even gave Henry Wilcox a red tie when he was giving his little, oh, no, it's safe as houses now speech. I'm like, why are you wearing That's true. Red? I did notice that one. Yeah. Right. Right. And Helen had a lot of red there. Mm-hmm. And she was the most confrontational Definitely. in right. that yeah. moment. And her no, it's very goofy, goofy red hat, that hat That hat is me. so silly. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, but that goes to what Ellie's saying, is that... Is that um, Margaret's hats become more and more kind of regal and yes. elaborate, and Helen's hat in that, like the juxtaposition of the two of them, mm-hmm. is that is that Margaret's wearing this very beautiful hat with like beautiful pins in it, and Helen's wearing her slightly goofy crocheted right thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, and I loved that Margaret's uh closet um in costume we call it a closet which are the recurring clothing items Mm -hmm. that someone wears so like if you have a character that always wears a specific vest that's part of their closet Mm -hmm. and it felt like margaret's closet shrank as soon as she was with henry because she starts wearing the same clothes the same muted tones Mm -hmm. the same hat you know whereas beforehand Every shot you saw her and she was in something else right. wonderful and different. And her costume just got smaller mm, and smaller as she fit into, into the role. You know, that role. And then, you know, Helen's costuming changes a bit, whereas Henry, his ties got a little bit more garish huh. by the end. Mm. I like that. So it's integrating through color. And the and the shapes of of Margaret's clothing was very interesting and I felt like the she started wearing coats she had a lot of buttons first of all a lot I, of I, buttons I still have like, like so many buttons, buttons. so many buttons very much I could, <laughs> yeah when we were watching so, it somebody pointed that out they're like oh don't you love that coat and I said I don't know that coat to me is very just buttons like it's all buttons that's all I can see so I love it visually but the be hell to put on yeah I'm but sure she, she yeah. also started wearing things with more kind of um, structured colors, which reminds me of what Ruth wore when she was in London. Oh, of like course, we had talked sure. also about mm-hmm. Ruth had very different outfits when she was at Howard's End and when she was in London. Mm-hmm. And w- Margaret started wearing these darker coats with like very kind of big colors mm-hmm. that really stood up. And that felt a lot like what Ruth had worn in London. She was dressing more like a Mrs. Wilcox. Yes. Exactly. I like that. I think that's very smart. Well, ladies, I think that we've done a fabulous job talking about this. Ellie, thank you so much for joining us. This yes. has been so much fun. Mm-hmm. Thank you for having me. I loved it. <laughs> um, okay, so first I'm going to talk about our next plans. Everyone's homework is that two weeks from now, we're going to talk about Jane Austen's novel, Sense and Sensibility, which I'm so excited. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, And we're going to have a special guest for that episode as well, Louise Barnes, who, oh my God, Liz, Uh even though Ellie's also a fan, we have managed up until this point to not mention black sales, (laughs) but now I'm going to. 
We managed it all the way through here. I was trying so hard. But the Barlow woman. Right. So, yes, Louise, <laughs> Louise Barnes, who plays Miranda in Black Sails, will be joining us today. I love her. Oh. <laughs> Louise, Ellie loves you. <laughs> But yes, so Louise is going to join us to talk about sense and sensibility. So we're going to do in our in our format that we've now established our great ad- adaptations. We're going to talk about um, the book. I believe it's um, it's May fourteenth. We will talk about the novel. Two weeks after that, we're going to talk about the film that was written by Emma Thompson, starring Emma Thompson, and directed by Ang Lee. Gorgeous. One of my very very favorites. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful mm-hmm. film. Okay, so in the meantime, Ellie, please tell everyone where they can find you on the internet. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ellie underscore A underscore Collins. Uh, you can find the Blood Curse Stories at TBCS Podcast or com. Thank you again so much for listening. Until next time, from Common Room Radio, I'm Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Alu. Can I just say podcast is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and our other shows, visit commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as $1 a month can make a big difference. Visit patreon.com slash commonroomradio to pledge support and access bonus features that are just for patrons. And join the conversation by using the hashtag CanIJustSay and follow us on Twitter at JustSayPodcast. We request that you keep your tweets respectful and positive, and you can always email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.